Hello, welcome to uh, Timely Insights um, and Timeless Wisdom, our series of Monday webinars. This is a series in which we are highlighting, this whole series has been about highlighting new and um, developing research out of JTS. And today we have kind of a different take on this, uh, new and developing research out of JTS. We're highlighting two things that are connected uh, that really show the depth of learning both by our faculty and the institution itself. Um, one of these is an exhibit that opens tomorrow through the JTS library. Um, seeing the unseeable imagery of Kabbalistic texts from the JTS library. And the other is a podcast called Exploring Kabbalah, also about K Kabbalah, um, that is uh, hosted by uh, faculty member uh, Eitan Fishbane. And so today we're going to have Professor Mordecai Schwartz and eight, Dr. Eitan Fishbane talking together about both of these elements and then kind of giving a sense of the podcast and the exhibit through the kind of visual culture that is at play in the exhibit. So before I introduce the, uh, the faculty members, I want to thank our generous sponsors. Um, they are, and I also want to welcome any first time attendees. Um, the uh, the the sponsors today are Drora and Maddie Shalev in recognition of JTS's wonderful community learning programs. If you're inspired like Drora and Maddie were to uh, to sponsor a session, there is a link in the chat. There are three different sponsorship levels, and we would love to have your support for this learning that reaches so many people throughout the country in so many different ways. Um, so the way this is going to work, because we have a slightly different format, generally we have one person speaking, today we have two, and we're addressing two sort of different yet related concepts, is we're going to um, have both um, Eitan and Morty introduce their uh, pieces, and then we'll have a time for questions after that, and then we're going to go kind of piece by piece. We have three or four different elements from the exhibit that we're going to explore both the content and the context of these pieces. And there will be some time for questions after we we uh, we conclude that piece. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce both of our, our lovely speakers who I've had the privilege of working with on this session and also on, you know, both in terms of have podcasted with both of them. Uh, Aton's podcast launches tomorrow, and you will find that anywhere where you can find your podcast. It's called Exploring Kabbalah. Um, and Morty and I previously worked on a podcast called The Evolution of Torah. So please check those out at our podcast um, site on the JTS website. Um, Dr. Aton Fishbane is the professor of Jewish thought at JTS. Um, and he is, he teaches courses in the literature and history of Jewish mysticism from medieval Kabbalah to modern Hasidism. He's the author and editor of eight books, the latest of which was published in 2021 by Oxford University Press. He's devoted his research and writing primarily to the development of Kabbalah in medieval Spain. And at present, his scholarship is devoted to three main topics. The Zohar is mystical poetry, the Sabbath and sacred time in Hasidic mysticism. Um, and the ideas of self and identity in Kabbalah. Marcus Mordechai Schwartz serves as the Henry R. and Miriam Rich Schnitzer Librarian for the Special Collections of the JTS Library, where he oversees the largest collection of Hebrew manuscripts in the world. Rabbi Schwartz is also a member of the Ta Talmud faculty at JTS, where he's taught for the last 15 years. His book, Rewriting the Talmud, is on the effect of the tradition from the land of Israel on the composition of the Babylonian Talmud, and it was released in the summer of 2019. So I'm really excited to be able to share um, the floor with both uh, Morty and Eitan, and I'm going to turn it over to Eitan at this point. And... Tani, can you ask him to unmute? I'm sorry. I just did. That's okay. Great. Thank you. Oh, I did. It's great. Um, and do you have the... Uh, um... I'm sharing the PowerPoint right now. Okay, great. Hi, hi everybody. Hi, hi. Um, this is uh, fantastic to 
fantastic to be with you and um, and to do this uh, this program together with uh, with my colleague uh, Professor Schwartz um, with, uh, with Morty and um, and, uh, th and this is uh, this is really uh, quite quite exciting that we're that we're bringing these uh, these uh, two uh, exciting features of our JTS um, resources and strengths together. So, so um, wonderful to wonderful to um, bring those together um, uh, uh, for you with you. Um, the the podcast that um, that uh, that Ellie was just mentioning um, is going to uh, deals with a. A, a range of a of, of the history of Jewish mysticism from antiquity to the modern period, and um, really represents a a take on a series of major features and issues um, that uh, that I see in uh, the history of uh, of Kabbalah, Jewish spirituality, Jewish esotericism. Um, Really, throughout the history of the Jewish uh, people, my my specialty, as as Ellie was mentioning, is in uh, medieval Kabbalah, specifically the Zohar. Uh, but we also cover uh, earlier material, um, which um, which which Morty is more of an expert in, and um, and we cover uh, meditative uh, Kabbalah uh, uh, as well, and and Kabbalah Tzfat, the Kabbalah the Ari. Um, of Isaac Luria and of Hasidism, and among the features um, that uh, that that are discussed in um, in this kind of history and phenomenology, or this discussion of the ideas and experiences, the theology, the the spirit, the spiritual um, experience of Jews throughout history, and their approach to um, religious life and engagement with the divine is um, rests on on a few pillars and a few pillars I think that actually dovetail uh, really nicely with some of the material we're going to be looking at today from the uh, from the rare collections so the first the first of these uh, which you see on the on the PowerPoint here of uh, the transcendent mystery of of being the infinite and the unknowable contemplated and experienced through that which the mind can grasp. Um, I would, I would say uh, in many ways, mysticism, what one of the main features that constitutes Jewish mysticism throughout um, history is the intuition and passionate, um, uh, passionate insistence um, of, uh, of the, of the mystics uh, that um, uh, that there is more to uh, reality than meets the eye, and immediately meets the eye. That there is a kind of transcendent mystery, a kind of deeper meaning. Um, that where where the inner mis inner life of God, the inner spiritual depths of divinity, are uh, discovered in the world, in the, in, in the Torah, in the life of mitzvot, in the human self, in the natural world. Um, and part, and part of what we're going to see also, um, is the way in which that manifests in the letters of the sacred Hebrew language, particularly of the divine name. Uh, but really, um, re really when the Kabbalists spoke of Torah Tassod, right, because there wasn't a the word mysticism itself doesn't appear in the history of of um, of Kabbalah or of Jewish mysticism, right? That was that was to some extent a kind of um, construction of scholars who were studying comparative um, phenomena. They would refer to it either as Kabbalah, the reception of spiritual um, tradition. Um, or as uh, Torah Hasod, the teaching of the hidden, the teaching of the transcendent, the teaching of the mystery. And so everything in our world, they would say, is a, um, is a marker, a portal, an opening into um, 
uh, into the into the hidden dimensions of divinity, right? So through the knowable of our world, we can come to have some glimpse, some um, insight um, of uh, the the mysterious realms of God that are otherwise inaccessible. Um, and and in that way, mysticism is much like artistic expression, much like poetry, much much like the visual arts, much like music and 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 a variety of other creative forms where where the creator, the 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 artist gestures toward the otherwise inexpressible, the otherwise ineffable, right? Un, unspeakable, unwritable, unexplainable, un, you, something you can't articulate dimensions of reality and divinity right so so how do we um how do how how does the the spiritual mind the spiritual soul um seek to both grasp and then express that which is seemingly beyond the rational mind or that which that which seems to to lie at the edges of ordinary thinking Right, which we could, which we could say, is what great poetry can do, right? Which is what great art can do, right? To push us to the limits of one way of thinking and open up the imagination, open up the um, the spiritual um, mysterious dimensions um, of of reality. Um, and as and as we see, and as we'll see also in the in the um, amazing piece we're going to look at in the collection, for the mystics, this often was expressed as a kind of visualizing of the divine name or of the or of the text of of um, of the Torah, which is understood to the essence of the essence of the text of Torah was understood to be a series of divine names. God and God's name are one in many ways, right? So part of what we're going to see are these these um, these these phenomenal devotional charts, which <clears throat> which which um, which feature the ineffable name, right? Which feature the tetragrammaton, and so this is a kind of kabbalistic way of expressing that which is beyond. Um, one one example, um, um, one example of this, uh, and, may, and maybe maybe we should go to the to the Zo to the Zohar text uh, now. Let's see, let's see. Oh, here, here we we, well, we could go back go back to the to that chart uh, br uh, briefly. So that so this is this is um, and and. Um, uh, Morty Presto Schwartz will have will have more to say about um, about the about the manuscript elements of a, of, of a lot of a lot of these uh, features. But here is a here's a kind of classic image on the right of um, of the chart of the Sfirot, the inner dimensions of God. Right, that whole that whole construction of ten circles you see there. <clears throat> starting with the the top one that says keter crown and going down to the bottom malchut that means kingdom or is also equal to shechina in in their um, symbolism represents the in their in their conception of the meta, of metaphysical reality of 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 the divine self Ten <clears throat> parts of God that are really one. The one that is the one that is ten, right? So, so where I thought there were many, there is really just the one. Um, an old teacher of mine once uh, once put it for the for the mystic, right? So, so uh, the the realities of the world round about us seem fragmented, seem separated, but really they are all part of the oneness of divinity that unites everything. And so too, God is one, like our, let's say our human selves <clears throat> are one, right? Our human bodies are one, but they're made up of all of these different parts, right? There's another way to think about it. Um, so, so one, um, um, one uh, quickly, uh, one quick uh, example, just to give you a, a flavor in, in, um, 
excuse me, in the English translation of um, of my dear colleague um, uh, and teacher uh, Daniel Matt. Um, this is a, this is a, a selection. Is, is there a, a, an excerpt rather excerpts from <clears throat> from a piece uh, that he first translated in 1983 in a book called Zohar, the Book of Enlightenment. Now, now there is a 12 volume um, a Zohar Pritzker edition, annotated and and translation um, is uh, is both uh, updated and and uh, different in, in various ways. Um, but but I wanted to just focus in on on a couple of elements here, right? Where where the um, the mystics who are speaking and the and the 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 main mystic of all of this, even though there's a conversation going on here, this is from the Zohar, which is late 13th century um, Castile Leon, now Spain. <clears throat> Um, even though it's projected back onto antiquity, they tried to pass it off as, or or say that it was ancient for all kinds of interesting reasons. <clears throat> but it was, but it's been shown to be a medieval uh, Spanish work, even though, um, even though we wouldn't say uh, Spanish at that time, right? This was the Kingdom of Castile. So on the one hand, <coughs> on the one hand, it says. Um, Right, it says that uh, there are certain colors that can be seen and certain colors that cannot. Right, there are certain dimensions of reality because because also for the Kabbalists, um, the different sifirot, which are the which is the Hebrew word for these dimensions, and it, and it has has a lot of different resonances in in uh, in the Hebrew of the, of the sifirot. <clears throat> Uh, different colors are assigned to the different um, to the different uh, sefirot. So there are certain colors, the <clears throat> let's say the, the the lower colors of divinity, the more accessible, revealed um, dimensions of God that can be seen. And then there are others that are that remain beyond our sight. Right? You might even say, um, like we like we now know in terms of uh, our, our science scientifically about our about our ability to perceive and and see uh, and see certain colors on the spectrum and colors that we can't see, right? Um, uh, so let's uh, let's um, let me see here for a second. Uh, right. So so. Um, Right. So, so the idea is that with with our with our eyes with our eyes open, with our eyes open, we only can see one revealed dimension of God. And he says that. Um, okay. Okay. We, oh, we we jumped the next page. Okay, that's good. So so right. So the 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 secret the secret. <laughs> Okay, um, right. The, the secret is the eye closed and open, closed. It sees the mirror that shines. Open, it sees the mirror that does not shine. Right. So that's to say that with our eyes open, uh, we see one revealed dimension of God, as it were. And I say as it were because they had a lot of anxiety about what you can see and what you can't, and whether God was uh, visualizable or not. Right. This is part of what we're going to talk about today. But then there was this idea that that your eyes closed somehow represents, let's say, a kind of uh, mysterious hidden sight, right? It's almost like <clears throat> the insight of closed eyes, right? Um, and you see Rabbi Elazar and Rabbi Abba celebrating and lamenting uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, they came and kissed his hands and they said, whoa, for you, when, the, when the world, when you disappear from the world and the world will be orphaned without you, who will illuminate the words of Torah? And then in saying this, we can go to the next, uh, oh, there, there we are, okay. Um, uh, uh, right, so 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 the secret is close, close your eyes, and this is one example in the Zohar actually of <clears throat> of a kind of actual meditative physical practice, right? So, uh, so do this delicately. For, um, you know, all, all, everyone at home, right? The secret is close your eye and roll your eyeball, right? So, they, so their idea was kind of a, a kind of touching of the eyeball gently with the eye closed. 
and the colors that shine and glow will be revealed, right? So in other words, right, we know neurobiologically that this stimulates the optic nerve and then you see different colors, right? Um, all, all the stuff that I know very little about. And their notion was they experienced this, right? That by closing that with the closed eye, one could see <clears throat> the hidden mysterious colors of the transcendent dimensions of divinity. But they could not, but but then they could not see because their eye was closed. The um, they right they they could they they could not see the revealed dimension of God without um, they could not see the they could not, not see the mysterious dimension of God without the closure of the eye and the insight with their eyes open. They only saw uh, that which was openly uh, revealed. Um, so, so part of, part of what we see in this, in this text here, right, is that, so Moshe or, or right, Moshe, our, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, the great, the Moshe who see the Torah <clears throat> is understood as the one who can see through the aspect laria hamayira, through the, through the lens that shines, right, um, um, or here, the mirror that shines, right, who can see through who can see through to the upper transcendent dimensions. <clears throat> um, and it's above, uh, it's, it's higher, it's more mysterious than, than, uh, than that lower revealed dimension. The rest of humanity, us ordinary folks, we, uh, we see through Shekhinah, who is the aspect of is Namira, is the kind of darkened lens. Um, that 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 which that which doesn't let in all of those upper lights, and yet the Shekhinah is actually referred to also as the prism through which all of the other lights flow into and are refracted. Right, so you might say it's a kind of indirect uh, indirect revelation that takes place um, uh, through through uh, through the lower uh, through the lower sphero. Uh, so it's so the page so the patriarchs even right they saw the the avot they saw through those colors that are revealed through those colors that are revealed they saw those hidden ones which oversee the ones that do not shine right so it was only <clears throat> through that which we can see and that which we can grasp that we come to a kind of insight or revelation or illumination of that which is beyond sight that which is beyond perception which is the sort of poetic dimension both of how poetry gestures beyond ordinary language ordinary knowledge ordinary sight and also um here as right as we move toward looking at uh, at some of the uh, some of these amazing manuscripts in the jts collection that kabbalists themselves saw this process of seeing the more mysterious transcendent dimensions of God or perceiving them, taking them in by encountering that which they saw in the world, that which they saw below, the, 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 the letters of the Hebrew language, the words of the Torah. So from that which is below opens up a window onto that which is on high, that which is in our world uh, becomes a marker or a portal into that which is otherwise um, transcendent and unseeable. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Fishman. We're going to turn this over to uh, Professor Schwartz now, um, who I hope is unmuted. Um, I am unmuted. I fabulous. Am unmuted. So I'll turn yes. it over to you. Uh, fantastic. Thank you so much, Ellie. I just I also want to take a second to to thank the Chalets uh, for sponsoring today's um, program. I think I think it's a fantastic thing whenever uh, we can have a, a, a Yisachar, a, uh, a, a donor uh, who can support, you know, to our learning and to our teaching. Um, I also want to want to thank Professor Fishbane uh, 
uh, for, for appearing with me. It's a humbling experience. It often is, by the way, at JTS in terms of the number of scholars, but it's a humbling experience uh, to have, uh, you know, such, a, such great scholarship and appear with such scholars. I give thanks every day for being, for my portion being uh, in the Beit Midrash. Uh, but, you know, I, I would just say that I'm, I'm, I always feel like I'm among the least among them. And I certainly feel that way today. So I really want to thank you, Eitan, for appearing with me. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, um, the exhibit, uh, and why it is that we're presenting this exhibit right now, uh, why we think, uh, that it's particularly salient and relevant to the moment, uh, you know, uh, going with the major theme of, you know, timely ideas. Uh, I think it's a timely insight. It's a timely I idea, uh, because, uh, this is, in fact, a, mo a moment in human culture and human history where we seem to be moving away from the written word, the embodied written word in the form of, of books and book culture, and moving to a culture of visual imagery. Uh, Marshall McLuhan already talked about this in the 1970s, a movement uh, to secondary orality, that you had an initial orality uh, where there was an oral culture. Uh, and then at a certain point, things get written down. You have literacy. And then moving to uh, film and television, you have a secondary orality, which is accompanied by the visual image. Uh, and I think that's all the more so with regard to the Internet. I think that's what's going on. I think one of the ways that uh, one of the things that we encounter uh, in terms of the disembodiment of life uh, is also the desire to have things that are physical and imagery that is physical. And so we're trying to provide that. We're trying to provide that. We're trying to show how people dealt with the lack of imagery in the past, this embodiment in the past. And I think some of these images are fantastic. So why are Jews relevant to that conversation? I think first and foremost, um, most of us know that uh, one of the, the earliest statements that we have um, in the Jewish tradition about imagery is its prohibition. Uh, which is a fascinating thing uh, that uh, um, in the 20th chapter of Exodus, uh, you get both in the Ten Commandments and immediately after the Ten Commandments, a kind of emphasis on not having imagery that is worshipped. Now, what that's normally taken to mean by the standard rabbinic interpretation is not that imagery is prohibited, but that imagery that you worship is prohibited. Images of gods images of angels if you're going to worship them uh anything that you're going to worship is prohibited uh the problem of course with that is that it's very hard for us to to for all human beings to have totally disembodied images and so one of the things that i think is really interesting about early modern kabbalah like post lurianic kabbalah um in the 17th 18th 19th centuries is this attempt to create imagery to create a concrete set of images uh, for people to use in devotion, to use in prayer, to use in uh, pedagogy, to use in teaching and learning. And um, that's in many ways, that's a one element of what we have to represent here. Words and the representation of words in many ways comes to replace uh, the, the depiction of imagery. But at the same time, you also have the notion that these things, these words are representative of actual divine faces, of part Sufim, which is really interesting. Uh, obviously, I already mentioned Lurianic Kabbalah. That, Lurianic Kabbalah has a, a great deal uh, of, uh, of what to say about imagery, about the, 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 the metaphors of faces. Obviously, uh, Eitan already talked uh, about uh, sort of pre and, and this is specialty, sort of the the Spanish or Castilian uh, kind of uh, Kabbalah, which precedes uh, Lurianic Kabbalah. A lot of our materials are Lurianic, uh, which means that dis that rupture, exile, right? That the metaphors of of you know sort of something gone wrong in the nature of the world. The world's been you know, the, the, the vessels have been broken, the world's been turned upside down. Uh, those, those kinds of things are very important. And the stability uh, of, of, of what was previously a fairly stable 
uh, system of, of depictions of divine, divine imagery have now become dynamic. And that's really what we see. We do see kind of a diamondism uh, starting in, early, in the early modern period. And we're going to talk about that. We'll talk about the, the Ilanot. Um, I think it's really important when we talk about, you already talked about Sfirot, and, and I'm not going to go into a great deal about Sfirot. I'm going to let you talk about that. But there are lots of different depictions of the Sfirot, and dynamic ones as well as static ones in this exhibit. And they're worth, they're worth seeing. They're really incredible. Some of them very graphically strong. Uh, and that's what I would also say about graph, graphic strength, the strength of an image, um, is that it leads to a facilitation with a visual devotion. Folks have the capacity to connect better. They just do. If you think about the way that... Um, Immigrants, for instance, were able to connect better with the English language through comic books and still are. Uh, it's just easier to connect with language if there's accompanying image. And that's a fascinating thing. Uh, the other thing that happens in the early modern period in terms of right sort of right after the Middle Ages. Right. So uh, the, the development of of the the printing pr press, the development of new communication technologies is not only kind of the overwhelming nature of information, but kind of a, a spread of information, a shared information. And, um, you know, thought, uh, philosophy had always, had always to some degree been shared amongst uh, Jews and Christians and Jews and Muslims. But Kabbalah, which, which in many ways is uh, about, uh, you know, has, a, has affinities, let's say, with, with kind of uh, the developing kind of, of science at the time, um, becomes a shared language in many ways with, with humanist Christians, especially in Italy in the period. And so you have the development of Christian Kabbalah alongside, and we show some of those things as well. In fact, the, the main image for the exhibit is taken from uh, Kabbalah de Nudita, right? So Kabbalah revealed, uh, which... Um, you know, is a is a Christian work, uh, and we have here in the in the in the image here um, that we're seeing here uh, a lot of symbolism. I and I just don't have time to go into here uh, in terms of uh, this individual uh, who is approaching a door of secrets, who's approaching a sun with uh, images of the Sfirot and the Partsufim, the divine countenances uh, shining down. Uh, is moving from Gentile wisdom, which is actually written on the page, to kind of Jewish wisdom, yet carrying both the New Testament uh, as well as the, the, the Hebrew Bible um, in her hand for explication, which is a fascinating kind of piece. Um, and here's what the, the uh, just go back one slide, and I'll talk about the, the collection just a second, but you can see how graphically strong the exhibit is. It's an exhibit worth, that's worth seeing. It's just beautiful. It's gorgeous. You should come in. You should take a look. Oh, that's one of the other things that I wanted to say. For me, it was really important to show that even though these works were made as works of devotion, as works with a very um, immersed, let's say, or immersive religious sensibility, they can be appreciated just on the level of images. Uh, and the, the, the exhibit is a beautiful exhibit aesthetically, as well as one that reveals its ideas through extended viewing. Uh, and I think we should appreciate it in that way as well, just as a beautiful ex aesthetic experience. Um, so we can talk about the, the next piece here. Uh, I, it was mentioned, I'm always kind of blown away. This is humbling as well, that I oversee the world's largest collection of, of Hebrew manuscripts. And I do, which, which I kind of pinch myself in the morning. Um, the, we have 45,000, uh, Cairo Geniza fragments, uh, in three different series. Uh, we are the, the second largest collection of, of Cairo Geniza fragments in the world after Cambridge, where the Taylor Schechter collection is. Uh, we have, uh, in addition to all of those fragments, a variety of, an, uh, a huge number of other sorts of fragments, binding waste, things found in bindings, all of those things. Really, really massive collection of manuscript fragments. But in addition to that, we have the world's large, largest collection of what are called complete Hebrew manuscripts, uh, 11,000, just these days, just over 11,000 uh, complete manuscripts. I'm not going to go into the term of what's the difference between a fragment and a complete manuscript. I can talk about that another time. That's a fascinating uh, question as well, because there are fragments that look like complete manuscripts and manuscripts that look complete manuscripts that look like fragments. Uh, but uh, uh, for the time being, we'll just we'll just leave that to the side. 
there are over 50 different, uh, in addition to the larger collection of Hebrew manuscripts, there are over 50 different languages represented, including all of what are called Jewish languages. I'm not going to go into what that, what makes a language a Jewish language right now. That would be the rest of our time. Uh, and um, of our manuscripts, uh, we have a very rich collection of Kabbalistic manuscripts. Uh, we have over 700 uh, Kabbalistic manuscripts of a variety of sort from a variety of different times. Uh, and we're showing just a very small uh, amount of our richness here. I haven't even talked about the printed books, the, the, the 15th, 16th, and 17th century books, uh, 18th century books that we have represented in the collection. I haven't talked also about the enormous print uh, collection that we have, um, you know, in terms of collections of prints, of broadsides, of single printed items, uh, which, you know, over 4,000 in our collection as well. Um, it's just a, an extraordinarily rich and powerful collection. We oftentimes say that we think of ourselves as the National uh, Jewish Library uh, in the diaspora, or the library of the Jewish people in the diaspora. And, and it's true. Uh, that is how we think of ourselves. I think that we are also a library that is open to anyone who's interested in seeing the richness of the Jewish tradition. Uh, and so we see ourselves as, 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 a, as a Jewish cultural institution, but an institution for world knowledge as well. Um, the re what prompted this exhibit is a discovery of a previously unknown uh, Ilan by the Ramchal, by, by Chaim Lutzato, a fascinating figure uh, who um, is uh, a, 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 this, we already knew we had one Ilan, I'm going to tell you what an Ilan is in a second, uh, by, by Lutzato, uh, but uh, Yossi Chayas and his work on the Kab, what he calls calling the Ilan, the Kabbalistic tree, these, these images, which are graphic depictions of the diamondism of the Sphero. That's what an Ilan is in a lot of ways. Uh, he was able to, 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 to discover another uh, or a second uh, Ilan. This we call the, the this is here, Ilana Partufim of Luzzato. One of the fascinating things about Luzzato is just the distinctive nature of his handwriting. His handwriting, which is very small here, you, you got to come and see it. Is, uh, is, is really distinctive. And uh, Chais knew the handwriting, was able to identify it. Uh, Luzzato uh, himself uh, was born, I want to say, in, in, uh, in, in 17, probably 09, maybe. And he, he passed away around uh, 1750. He died relatively young. He died in a, in a, in a uh, a, 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 I believe, a cholera epidemic uh, in Israel after having immigrated with his family uh, to the land of Israel. Um, but he spent most of his life in Italy. Uh, this uh, particular Ilan he made when he was a, a young man, I believe still in his, in his 20s or his early 30s. And um, there are two things going on here in this image. One is you can see the diamondism of the Sphero, the divine energy flowing from enumeration of of divine quality to enumeration of divine quality. The circles are the enumerations. And then the, the pipes in between are the places where the energy flows. And that flow of energy, which is affected by human devotion and performance of divine, divine commandments of mitzvot, actually in the, creates uh, like a tikkun, uh, a, a, a change, a, a, an improvement of the divine flow. Uh, in the, the Lurianic system. And so you actually have then uh, new, uh, uh, you know, enumerations, new sphere, new uh, orders of sphero popping out, new uh, parts of theme and combinations of parts of theme and qualities pop popping out. And you see the, the, di the, the dynamistic, I think I said that right, the, the changing qualities of these things, you're supposed to actually see them sequentially and you're supposed to kind of go from top to bottom and you can see them filling out. Lutato doesn't label them really all that well here in the, in the central image. Uh, I said, I think this is kind of like, and I could be totally off base about this, uh, Eitan can correct me, but I think this is sort of like a scholar who has uh, got the images and like, like index cards and he wants to remember uh, how the enumerations work so he's not filling in uh, the blanks necessarily. 
uh, on the, the 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 open the open circles. Um, the work on around on all around the writing all around, which is the really distinctive thing, uh, is not related in any way at all to to the uh, Elon in the center to the to the, the imagery. It's actually a work that attempts to just kind of like introduce Kabbalah generally. Uh, Lutato is very known for his his introductory ethical work, his accessible introductory work, the Misilat Yisharim, the Path of the Upright. Apparently, he also was working as a young man on an introductory uh, work uh, of Kabbalah. I don't know that it's been published. I don't think it has, uh, but it's represented here in manuscript, uh, which is which is uh, uh, really, really interesting and fascinating. Uh, it's just a work that lays out in an introductory way um, the basic elements of how he understands the Kabbalistic system to work. Uh, the last thing I'm going to say about Lutato is he's also known as one of the main fathers of Hebrew literature. He was a playwright also. Uh, which is a uh, fascinating thing. He wrote plays for for weddings and special occasions, and uh, which and you can think about sort of like what's going on in terms of uh, the Italian context and the Commedia dell'arte and all of that. It's fascinating. But he's working. He wrote poetry also. It's a fascinating figure. Okay. So I'm going to unmute, and we're going to take a moment to um, to uh, do some Q and A. Uh, and we have a number of questions ranging in all sorts of different elements. Um, I'm going to throw this first one out. Um, I believe it's more in Aton's line, but and it's kind of these are two connected questions. One is, how does this fit with kind of ideas we have around Eastern um, mysticism and Kabbalah? Uh, not Kabbalah, sorry, Eastern mysticism and the, the ideas that come from the East. How is it connected? And then similarly, as we're thinking about that idea, is there a way that the Spirot act as a personal journey of sorts and that we're mo moving this through? And I have also always heard, maybe not always, but have had varied yoga instructors at various times say, you know, the chakra, it's like Kabbalah, and that they are connecting the spirit to a, um, to specifically the chakra in yoga. So I'm just putting both of these very, very big ideas into one micro question for you, Eitan, if you want to jump in there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, um, uh, first of all, um, thank, thank you, thank you, Morty. Won wonderful to um, to learn from you and to and to um, to be in dialogue together. So, uh, so it's a real it's a real it's a real pleasure. Um, and um, so I want to I want to say a couple of things. For, first, um, first, just just one thing that that uh, before before I guess before I uh, really answer your your question, Ellie. The you know when I'm thinking about the, in terms of the the Zohar and 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 imagination and image and when we're talking about um, its relationship to later Kabbalah um, in some in some ways uh, and um, in some ways um, the the Zohar in particular and related Kabbalah is is a, is a work of the mystical poetic imagination right or or as one as one um, teacher of mine referred to it as as Jewish verbal iconography, right? Um, uh, and and others and other scholars, um, uh, other scholars like uh, particularly like Elliot Wolfson, who wrote a book on vision and imagination in, uh, in medieval Jewish mysticism uh, in 1994, has, has shown extensively how um, how the tension between between an iconism, right, the prohibition against seeing an icon and, and worshiping it, and the, and the phenomenon of there being um, icons or symbols or images is deeply ingrained into the texture of Kabbalah um, in general. Um, and the, Zo the Zohar in particular, as the great masterpiece of, of, Kab of Kabbalah, and to which all of these Later Kabbalists, uh, um, Lutato uh, wrote, wrote wrote texts that were seeking to mimic the style of the Zohar, and and uh, Moshe Cordovero in the 16th century before that wrote uh, wrote a long commentary on the Zohar, and all of the Lurianic system is based on the, all the parts of Fima are actually based on a section in the Zohar. So to some so to some extent, there's a kind of 
uh, and and of course, and the Zohar represents the summit of a hundred years of Kaba, of Kabbalah in in what we now call Spain. But it really is a deeply imaginative work, right? So, so in other words, like to read this work is essentially it's essentially like painting the pictures, right? Or or drawing the images, and oftentimes in highly mythic, highly eros and gendered filled, highly metaphysically erotic dimensions, right? Of of the yearning of the male and the female and the and the and the flowing of this and the flowing of that. Um, so so there's a there's a there's a there's a deeply embodied gendered um, sexualized dimension to the way in which the Kabbalists imagined divinity. Um, and and this, this definitely goes back to the 13th century. Um, the, the part 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 of um and, and and I think and I think that and I think that the those examples that you were that you were showing um, Morty are, are are deeply important as sort of how the how the system of the Sfirot as the flow of this energy right because because really the really these these diagrams of God if you will right or these maps of divinity that that the that the mystics used as kind of contemplative focal points. Um, were these representations, and you see that as 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 uh, Professor Schwartz was was mentioning, right? Those lines that you see between each of the circles, those represent the flow of energy, the flow of divine energy, like the flow of the lifeblood, the life breath of cosmic divine mystery, right? The energy of all existence. Um, that's it's flowing all together like everything is connected through us right and and this relates a lot to your your point and your question ellie um which had to do with correlations to other religious and spiritual traditions other <clears throat> mystical traditions and and uh and, and yoga uh, and and buddhist traditions certainly among them right which are um which which even even though traditions like 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 yoga in particular and and adaptations of buddhism have met the new age as has kabbalah right and it's been they've been adapted in different ways they're deeply rooted in particular religions and particular religious theologies and symbolisms and so forth um but the idea that you were talking about specifically of the of the whether it's the flow of energy right uh, um and and the sense of different centers of energy um is is both is both to be found in, in a number of a number of the eastern traditions you mentioned also in other religious traditions and definitely in kabbalah so when we talk about this energy flowing through the spherot of god what they would call the shefa ha'elohi right the, the the divine abundant flow this like river of light they would call it right the nahara din nahora in the zohar or or Hanahari Yotseme Eden Lashkotatagan, right? The river that flows from Eden to to um, irrigate the field or in the fields of re fields of being, right? Flowing with divine life and energy. Um, and then part of what you were saying, Ellie, which I think is is right on, is um, that the Kabbalists, like these other uh, mystics of other religions, definitely saw. Right. In the same sense that, that Morty was mentioning, right, that we talk about this idea of the human being being created, but Selem Elohim in the image of God. Right. And the question is, what does that mean? Right. So many people have debated that over the years. Right? Does it, well, could it be that we have this, that our bodies are sort of like God? Right. And, and, and there were those who, who thought that. Right. And then Maimonides in the Middle Ages came on and said, no, no way. Right, and that had that, and that had a huge influence on later, and then the mystic, and, and then the mystics came up and said, "Maimonides, you got it all wrong. It's all about the body, and I'm going to show you show you how." Right, but it's not the body you think; it's the body that alludes to the divine. So, Salem Elohim, image of God. In this sense, let's say let's talk about somebody like Cordovero, who we were speaking of before, Moshe Cordovero, the Ramak, who uh, like who who. Um, who lived in the 1500s, the 16th century, in the 16th century <coughs> Tzfat Renaissance before Lutzato, um, but was uh, but was part of the the Lurianic, uh, pre Lurianic, sorry, and he and he and he wrote a 24 volume commentary on the three volume Zohar, um, so he had a lot to say about it. Though the Zohar itself is thousands of pages. Um, 
among his teachings was um, was the, was the way in which our spiritual psychology, our moral behavior, our pietistic behavior, our our selves are imprinted with this divine structure of the spherot, right? That 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 we are. It's not that it's not it's not that we're anthropomorphizing God. It's that we have been theomorphized. Whoa, right, right. So it means that we we are embodiments of divinity in some mysterious way, right? Um, and and part of what that means for 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 Cordovero in Comer Devora, the palm tree of Deborah, which is so powerful, is that he says, okay, well, how am I like this sphera? Right. Well, I should act in this way and I should I should control my emotions in this way and I should behave in th- I should behave with grace and kindness and love toward in this way. Right? I should restrain my my harsher tendencies. All of this is bound up in how is my psychology, my shefa, right, my 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 chi or ki, right? How is how is that how is that a manifestation in in the world of divinity? Just like the Kabbalists believe, well, you know, it's not just in the human being; it's also in the tree that you see see around you. There's this amazing text in the Zohar where the Kabbalists are sitting under a tree and they and they're speaking about overlooking the Sea of Galilee and they're they're viewing the beautiful shores of Galilee in the shade of the tree. Never mind the fact that it starts with Rabbi Shimon saying, "How one, how wonderful is this tree? Let me stop my Mishnah right now." And right, the Morty Morty knows why this is uh, this is an amazing inversion of the Mishnah, right? Where he's where he's he's actually saying, "Oh, a tree! I got a crown with Torah." Maya um, Fe So anyway, they're sitting under the tree and they're talking Kabbalistic secrets, and then they get up and they say, "This tree is the tree of life. It is the Elana de Chaye." And, he, and Rabbi Elazar says to his father, his teacher, Rabbi Shimon, hey, Abba, we were sitting under this tree, the tree of life, the whole time. And we have to crown it with words of Torah because whether they meant that that was actually the tree of life or that it's a kind of lower reverberation of the divine tree, right? That everything is connected for the Kabbalists. Everything for the mystics. Everything is one. The energy is flowing. Okay. I I, I, I went off. No, no, it's everything. Directions. that That's one of the challenges. Ten different directions. Okay. <laughs> of Kabbalah is the challenge of all of these pieces. I wanted to put one question back to Morty and then we want to, I want to get into some of the, um, into some of the images themselves, just because they are so unique and interesting. Morty, in thinking about this exhibit, um, were there, you know, and one of the the areas in which you guys are exploring is this idea of Christian Kabbalah. How does that iconography fit in with this kind of broader Jewish iconography? And where, wh- what are the ways that you saw overlap between the kind of more Jewish iconography or images, let's go with images in, as opposed to iconography, and how do the rabbis kind of separate themselves from those images? Right. So we we, we are often, I think, under the impression that when we talk about uh, Kabbalah, um, we're talking about a system which is an insider system, that it's designed primarily for scholars, it's designed primarily for, for Jews. Um, one of the fascinating things, though, about Kabbalah is its 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 capacity to spread and become popular. Uh, that there's a popularization uh, of Kabbalistic imagery, both among Jews who are who are not necessarily scholars, and on the other hand, a popularization of Kabbalah amongst Christians, most of whom are scholars, but see a the a, a kind of um, supernal wisdom or maybe ancient wisdom uh that uh that 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 is suffused with with Kabbalistic imagery and language um and so there's a kind of adoption of many uh, uh ad- adoption and adaptation let's say it that way uh of, of many of the f- kind of basic principles of law um there are you know sort of these narratives within within Kabbalah uh especially Lurianic Kabbalah about disruption and uh, tragedy 
and then uh, a return, a tikkun, and then a restoration that fits very nicely uh, with uh, the basic narrative of Christianity uh, in terms of passion and resurrection. Uh, and so they're adopted. The other, the other piece of this is you get a claim, especially in Kabbalah de Nurita, which is a book we're uh, sort of one of the books we're highlighting here. The notion that uh, Kabbalah it gives you the capacity to explain Christianity in a way which is full and complete, uh, because the way they put it. Gentile wisdom is simply insufficient to explain the full mysteries of Christianity, that you needed to have uh, a Jewish wisdom as well, a Jewish esoteric tradition to come in and to fully fill that out. Is that a humanistic impulse? I think it absolutely is a humanistic uh, universalist impulse, which is one of the things that's happening uh, when we talk about, you know, the, the, the burgeoning sort of Renaissance and then Enlightenment. Um, uh, kind of more open and liberal versions of, uh, of, of Christian tradition in the period. And so is it, is it you know, sort of uh, what we would call appropriationist? I mean, I have to say, I think that Jews are used to being appropriated. I think that our ideas are, are, are often appropriated. And I think that's how human culture kind of like works. I think it's a good thing in many ways that people can share their ideas across traditions. Uh, I would also argue that in many ways, um, you know, following Gershom Shalom, the, 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 there's a kind, there is a kind of neo or, or, um, you know, origin that a lot of these ideas have that Plotinus already has a kind of proto system of what look a lot like Spherot, uh and these pipes like Zizigis, you know, his Zizigis look a lot like the, the Kavim and uh, all of that. So there does seem to be a, a kind of origin uh, in Plotinus. And I think, I think Neoplatonism Neo also influences uh, the East, Eastern tradition. Um, you know, I think there's, a, there's a, a kind of shared set of ideas at their core here. I think there are also some very significant cultural differences. I think one of the main differences is the importance of a word. Um, and I think that you know, Western mysticism in general, meditation devotion is often focused on word uh, rather than on mere breath. And I think that, uh, although there's a little bit of an oversimplification, uh, and I think that um, that in particular, Jewish mysticism really is focused very much on words and letters and combinations of letters uh, and hyperliteralism, hyper the hyperliteral use of words. Um, and so that that many was what makes the the our, our sort of mysticism kind of a distinct sort. Um, so that's that's everything that I would say about the ideas. I haven't talked about the imagery though. Let's talk about the imagery. I'm going to share my screen again, and we're going to jump into some of these images um, of which words are an incredibly important part. So let me turn this back over to my screen. And uh, Eitan, if you wouldn't mind giving us, this is a uh, a, a form called Shviti. We have two of them. There are, there are more than this in the exhibit. We have picked two of the, I think there are about four in the exhibit itself. Um, what does this sort of activity, how does this uh, kind of, promote a Kabbalistic visualization. What are we looking at here? Oh. Do we need to unmute um, Eitan? This is the fun and games of like, I can see things, I can't quite see things. I, there we go, yes. No, he just muted. I think it's Tani and I were both unmuting him at the same time. You got it, Tani? I'll let you take control. I. Um. Okay. Maybe Morty, you'll start out, and we'll get Aton un <laughs> unmuted. I, I just. It's not unmute, but I, okay, I'm going to try it one more time. There we go. Here, here he is. Oh, I got it. Um, so, um, 
So first of all, these are extraordinary, and, and more and Morty, I'm, I'm sure we'll have we'll have um, uh, what what to say about that as well. The um, a couple of things that I would that I would that that I would mention in terms of Kabbalistic devotion or conceptions of divinity is uh, um, the 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 Shiviti um, uh, charts, as it as it were, or, or diagrams. Uh, which which come from um, which come from the uh, which come from the from the the line from the Psalms, right? I place the Lord before me always, right? Uh, of of Shivita um, and 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 there it is. Um, specifically, I have placed Yudhe Vavhe before me always, right? Um, so, so that and and that and that in itself is very is is very significant here. The um, uh, so on, on the one hand, on the one hand, right, you see the you see the particular emphasis on on the kind of the nature of the yud hey and the vav hey as a as a as a visualization. And actually, one in one kabbalistic text that I um, that I uh, wrote about in my first book on Isaac of Akko, which is in the meditative Kabbalah section of the podcast, it's, and the book is As Light Before Dawn, published in 2009 with Stanford, is, is that because, despite the fact that the name was prohibited to be uttered out loud by people after the destruction of the temple, right? This was only the, the, the high priest, the Kohen Gadol, who would recite one poor one could visualize, imagine it, uh, imagine and visualize, visualize it <clears throat> as a kind of substitution for speech in the action of devotion is really quite interesting because the yud he vav he for the Kabbalists represents the, the unity of, of divinity and of the Sfirot themselves. How so? Um, the yud represents keter, the top sphera. The he represents um, uh, no, I'm sorry. The the yud represents sorry. The yud represents chokma rather, right? And, and usually the um, uh, which is the second sphera and the little the little uh, um, uh, tag sh- tag, right? The little little the little uh, flag of the yud at the top there. Points toward the nothingness that is beyond, but our crown, the top sphera, which is understood to be the nothingness, the ayin, that which is transcended beyond, is if that is sometimes visible or invisible. It's the ehye asher ehye. I will be that that which I will be. That God, and it's also the ah, the open breath sound, right? Uh, to go to go with the breath and word. But the way that the Sirota represented is the Yud is Chochma, is, is wisdom, which is also the, this is also the masculine seed in the sexualized version of this. The He is Bina, who is the feminine womb. So Yud and He unite together like male and female and birth the rest of the Sfirot. Uh, the Vav is generally understood to the middle six spherot below that, right? Because we've done the first three. Um, also, it's also the, the middle line of the spherot. It's called the Kav Ha'em Tsa'i, or it's called the... It's also, it's also sometimes it's Tiferet as well, which is which is one of the spherot below, but it includes all the six, but it's Vav numerically. Vav numerically represents six also, right? So it's the, it's the middle six it's the line of the sphero, and then, and it's also it's also the lower masculine, right? In a kind of um, not so subtle phallic sense, which is actually is part of uh, Kabbalistic mythology, as Ellie Wolfson has shown extensively. And then the lower hay um, is uh, Shekhinah, is the lower feminine. So the vav and the hay there unite together, and she is the lower womb, right? So it's like. Male and female, male and female, right? I know we're they were representing this is this is this is very much within binary, right? Um, and and the yud hey and the vav hey for 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 the kabbalists represents this then this totality of this world. So by gazing at the yud hey vav hey, 
the meditatively, the Kabbalists is using it as a kind of like to go back to the Eastern uh, comparison, using it as a kind of mandala or a kind of visualization object that is meant to visualize, but not visualize God at the same time, right? You're kind of visualizing a kind of um, manifestation of God in the form of the word that is unpronounceable, right? The word that is ineffable, right? So the God that is transcendent, the God speakable is represented in this word, this so, name of God. And it's also who Vishwachad. I want to make sure we give right. Morty some time to give some background on these sure. images, which sure. for some reason sure. in, yes. in this has decided to, but I think Morty, you wanted to, or, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think I think I want to I wanted to uh, you wanted to focus get, on this one anyway. So that okay. one back. And yeah. Um, so so uh, the I'm not sure why this moved out, but the, the the image on the left, the very colorful image, which is quite beautiful, actually, uh, is a hand paint artist who who made this image, uh, you know, by um, uh by by hand, um, which is which is you know sort of something that artists continue to do the, to this day, um, uh, you know. And next to it is oh look at that it's come back. Uh, next to it is in fact a, a woodcut, which is a form of printing, a block print. Uh, and the reason that this is a block print is because it's it's relatively early in the in the history of, of the technology of printing. Uh, there are two different kinds of prints, really. Uh, you could say there are three, I suppose, but but the third one didn't develop until uh, relatively recently, uh, which is on the one hand, uh, you have um, a woodblock print where I cut away uh, the negative imagery and lay the, uh, I, you know, I relieve the image and then I, and then, then I lay the ink on it's an engraving where I cut the image into, I incise the image into a metal plate, and then I I put the 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 ink down and it. it's below the surface. Um, that's how the technology actually works. So one is on the surface. That's the kind of relief printing or block printing. The other is an engraving where the ink sits below, and I use a lot more pressure. Uh, with a wood block, I can't it into. Um, I can, but it's difficult to put it into the same page with text. So I have to print it on a, any, any text I have in here. I can't use movable type. I have to actually relieve away. With an engraving, I can have multiple print, take, take uh, uh, multiple uh, rather plates, and I can take away and put in uh, into the same, the same galley. Uh, multiple different kinds of, of imagery. Uh, the more recent kind is what's called planograph, where, where I actually lay like lay an image on the surface without actually cutting anything into the plate. That's very, very recent. Um, what's really amazing about this image is that all of these, these images you have to think about are the artist had to cut into the woodblock the opposite image. In other words, what he's cutting away is not the image, it's everything but the image. Uh, and so that requires an enormous amount of skill. And the, the, the result is that what you see is there's a lot of negative space here. All of the negative space uh, is represented by the, the, the white, uh, which is not printed with. In other words, all of that's below the surface that the artist has actually, has actually uh, kind of created in the woodblock. I'm talking about the one on the, the right here. Um, but even more interesting is that all of these words, all of the letters had to be created in the same way. You can't use move. If we can, can we, can you, can you, you had the menorah up before. Can you put that back up again uh, from, from the woodblock? Yeah. Oh, oh uh, you don't have one. There was one before. That's it. Where the, where the menorah is blown up. If you look there, uh, you can see uh, that there, there is a lot of work being done with the letters themselves. You have the statement, El Pene Hamanoraya Iru Shivat Hanerot, right? So uh, a verse uh, from, I believe that's uh, Parshat Chukat, if I'm not mistaken, um, right? That the, 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 the lights on the menorah uh, really turn in towards the central face of the menorah. And you can see how the wicks in the image are arranged so that the ones on the 
the outside or central wick. Um, and then below here, you have Psalm 67, but written in this fascinating way that they're all written look at over each one of 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 the wicks you have three letters so you have lamed mem nun which is the first letters of limanatseach limanatseach is finished out with the next two letters over the next uh, the next uh, the second wick but you also have the first letter of the next word even though they're not spaced so the the phrase is limanatseach benigginot um uh Mizmor Shir, which is Psalm 67, right? So it's a often how the Psalms start, right? You have for the leader um a a a a a Mizmor Shir, a uh a, a a song that's going to be played on a stringed instrument, the Nigi note. Moving over to the last of the seven, right, it dips down, Psalm 67 dips down. On the seventh of between the two pieces of the candelabrum, you actually have right there, right, Elohim, Yichonenenu, so uh, the El, uh, Panav, uh, Heir, Sela, right? So this is a replication in many ways of the, um, I think I, I got it right. Uh, I couldn't quite read it, but I got it pretty close. It is the same language from, from or, or a reformulation of the language uh, from, from number six, the priestly blessing that we're familiar with, right? Like from bar mitzvahs and weddings and all of that, right? God will cause his countenance to shine you on you, right? God will be gracious to his ideas. You have right here, the idea of God's face shining out uh, and, and the representation, this menorah is a representation of God's face, face shining out. And it is the seven lights of the candelabrum. I'm sure Eitan can tell you about the seven lower spherot uh, and that you have this representation of light, a representation of, of, a, of a partouf shining out. All of this symbolism is here. The way the letters are split up here is, is very much something that you see as part of kind of recombinations of letters in Kabbalah almost kind of becomes like that Koteret, which doesn't mean anything as it, that that opening of the psalm, which is just talking about what it is and that it's played on a stringed instrument, is turned into kind of like a divine name, which is like really fascinating by the recombination of letters. That's fascinating. And then the other piece, I, I find that fascinating. And then the other piece that's really interesting is these words are now reformulated as an image. They no longer are what they were. Now they are totally reformulated. They are shining. They are illuminating. The divine face is, is, is illuminating through us. And the Shafa, the shining out to us from this, divine, this representation of the divine face. And you know what? The other thing that's amazing about this, this is popular. This is not for scholars. This is something that people see. It's written in Sidurim, right? It's something that is part of popular culture. How Kabbalah just her daily life of of, uh, of of a regular plain old shul going jew uh, uh and it's right um do so and the instruction you find in cedarim is fascinating that a person should look at letters they should focus on the letters even if they don't know what they mean and the divine abundance will divine blessing you know descend upon them uh which is a fascinating idea as well so okay so that's what i'm going to say so talk a little so, bit about the technology and a little bit about what's going on here i mean and i think that's one of the things about this exhibit is each one of these images is so complex and so detailed we're going to move ahead to actually one of the i would say superstars of this exhibit um and this is one of the ila note that uh is featured in the exhibit um i uh morty if you want to give us kind of very because we're we're kind of nearing the end of our time so i want to make sure we have enough time to get into the to the meat of this but if you could give us a little right. bit of advice, i don't i think somebody would make this um okay so fine so there's a little bit of an, an argument about about how and why and i'm just going to scroll started, through it so you can see how long this piece actually is yeah. uh as it appears you know only part of it appears on our screen yeah it's split in three here it's one it's one it's one piece um the the the, low, the Ilano uh may be in their origin like have a didactic purpose like for teaching and learning right so that people can see diagrams because it's hard that's the thing about kabbalah is that it's very difficult right uh that's why it's uh there's so much verbiage i think is because it's difficult it's hard to understand 
Um, and I think that's one of the ideas is that, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words that you can kind of cut through a lot of the verbiage and actually depict what's going on with an Elon. I think that's one thing that's going on. Another is that p potentially, at least, it is a vehicle for personal devotion where I can actually scroll through or scroll down and see the changes happening. That can be that can be another element. And that's a meditative process. M maybe one, maybe both. Who knows? This is a really interesting one because it's also uh, a, a hybrid. Uh, the colophon, the scribal statement of responsibility at the top, talks about the patron, gives the patron's name and says it was made for him uh, in order that, that he have blessings and protection. So it's it's an amulet too. this one. It's not just a regular Elan. It's also a hybrid Elan amulet or something like that, uh, which is really interesting. Uh, there's also this really interesting feature at the top. We see these nested uh, representations of the spheroth, the nested letters. This one happens to be very graphically strong, the particular scribe had a really good keen sense of how space works and how to use a positive the 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 the, the write out the letters and then also use the negative space uh, and to create a really balanced image on the page uh you have here uh i want to turn that part over to um oh go ahead Aton. so i'm gonna no problem uh if if you don't mind is there anything else I, that I think I said the things that need to be said. <laughs> Thank you so much. Aton, if you want to get into this piece about the nested letters and the sphere out, how they connect, I would really appreciate it. Um, um okay. The, 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 the mysteries of the muting and the unmuting. Um, the, can everybody hear me? Okay, good. The the um um uh, it's the cold mamadaka that has emerged. Okay, the so so uh, let me just 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 for, for a second before men, uh, talking about this. Uh, the, the also the 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 issue that you were mentioning before about the representation of the seven lower spheroth or, or of the menorah, right? So so one of the key features of Kabbalistic theology is is that is is of a kind of luminous divine being. Right of and this and this this is actually quite cross cultural. So you have the idea of God as an ontology of light, God as a being of light, and therefore to meditate upon, to pray to, to contemplate God, one achieves enlightenment, right, or in, illumination, right. One is illuminated. One 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 shines with that with that with that light right so so and and this and 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 the and the use of light imagery in all in all sorts of ways to talk about the spherot and so in, in actually the word spherot in some in some in some cases was correlated to sapir sapphire and at least at least according to some right so so that it, it right there's a kind of shining as it were um so 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 there god shines through the shines as 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 presence and then there's also as we see here there is this um god as god the sphere god as the spherot right the spherot are god and god as concentric reality and, and here a concentric reality that is also um, letter focus and textual focus, right? So the so here and this and and I and I, I first I first encountered this in a in a um, right right this, the precedent of Isaac of, of Akko in episode five meditative Kabbalah. This this is this is found in um, also in uh, Moscow Ginsburg seven seven five and and uh, which is the one full manuscript of I, Isaac of Akko that we have or one of the best. Um, who was he was a late 13th century, early 14th century ca uh, Kabbalist to bridge the meditative and the spherot based Kabbalah. But here, if you look at this graphically, right, the outer the outer cover the outer line is a kaf, right, which stands for keter, crown, and then inside that you have the you have a chet for chokma, and inside that. You have Bina, uh, Bet for Bina with that little tail there to get to give it away at the bottom, right? Bina meaning understand. That's the third Sphira. Keter Chokma Bina. Then 
what do we have what do we have there um uh wait a second here no first there is keter chokhma bina um dal so so there so there that would so that so that's a, that, that's actually that's actually a li- that's actually a little bit it's a little bit odd in the sense that that would be um that would be that would be uh that would be dean uh and the other one would be chesed so i'm i'm i'm, I'm a little surprised I think, I think it's i think it's i think it's dot i think i think that's supposed to be dot it could, it could, dot it, chesed and then to gavura it could it could, it could be yeah, right it could be it could be it could be that way right because right, because gavura would then parallel chesed right. so dot, so but dot. i think i think but it's not it's not me who's like it's not my great knowledge it's just that that the rest right. of the elon has dot down below right 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 so right. so so, so right you, Right, so that, so that so that would be right. So that so that so that would be a different that would be a different um, a different schematic actually than 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 a lot of than a lot of the other a lot of the other cases. So the, so so right. So this so this would be so this would be right, and that and that's also where you have that's also where the where the where the Chabad model of Chochmah Bin Adat comes from yeah. comes from certain Lurianic system, whereas some of the earlier Kabbalah like in Isaac of Akko, it would have been a it would have been a um, a uh, chet, then a then a um, right, uh, uh, the bina. Then it would be a, then 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 there would then there would be a chet within it. So anyway, so here so here there here there's dot. Then there's then there's uh, which is which is knowledge. Then there's chesed, which is the chet there, uh, which is kind of a, a love and grace or the 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 right side of, of divine compassion. Then 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 givura, which is uh, mm-hmm. In that which is which is strength, severity, or 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 judgment. Then you have the taf that is tiferet, which is splendor, which is the balancing point between chesed and gevura, uh, balancing point between lo- between pure love and pure severity. Um, then uh, right. The Netzach and Hod, right? So then you'd have the Netzach is is um, it means eternity, uh, Hod, um, splendor, beauty. Um, so those are those are uh, again on the on the right and the left. Then in the middle, you you then have um, uh, Tzadik. You have Tzadik. And it's, uh, this is this is this is a Yod. It's it's I know it looks weird, but this is supposed to be a Yod with like so that'll be ta- 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 That's right. And it's only uh, the only reason I know again is because they're listed immediately below. Right. Because 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 it's here. Sorry, but it's uh, a hard. Hold, hold you so yes yes yes. So 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 it's interesting because in because in because in because in some of the other some of the other um, manuscript handwritings uh, um, that I've seen that 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 is represented as a tzadi. But but I, I see here so so, that, so that'd be yisod as. Um, as uh, uh, the the lower divine masculine um, and Malchut as um, as uh, Shechina, right? So that, so then you can see right. So then it's so then it's connected to those there. Not not so much the right and the left, right? As you see when you look down the lower the lower part of this um, of this system, right? It, here it's represented as just one as one straight uh, column. Um, and then below that, uh, you have the you have the in, the intricacies of of the create of the process of the creation of the world. It's con- it's concentric reality below that. But in other in other cases that I've seen, you'll also have the sphere themselves represented as concentric circles. So it <clears throat> it varies according to the it varies according to the system of thought or the t- or the time period. But you have but you have different these different models to represent that they are kind of different images or symbolic illusions that represent meditatively the divine reality and just and just to build upon what you were saying morty um with regard to uh, both this and 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 the larger picture right that it's sort of sort of sense of how these are on the one hand representations are they're 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 trees in the sense, right, as 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 like diagrams of divinity, maps of divinity, as Chayas also said, um, right. So on the one hand, they're representations of a kind of 
they're, they're a way of talking, a, a way of depicting, of drawing divine reality, um, but in a way that was that was um, more palatably internally Jewish, right? Um, and then, but but then they also are these kind of like like we we're talking about with the Yud Hey uh, Vav Hey model. They also are meditative contemplative focal points right so they're they're both right as you were saying right they're both they're both representations of the ontology of the larger this larger sense of being maps of divinity but also maps of divinity that the devotee or the person in prayer the person in meditation um is to use to follow their mind their consciousness into into god so we're nearing the end of our time, and I want to make sure we have time for kind of a final wrap-up question. Um, in terms of the way, you know, in both of your understandings, both from, you know, kind of this, from this object standpoint and from this content standpoint, um, and also, you know, with these vacuums, is there a sense from what you've read about the need, the desire, the urge to meditate on the divine and where this comes from and what this does for those who embark on this journey? Um, so um, I, th I think I think I would just respond from a from a personal place. I think I, th I think I think in, in terms of my own personal needs. I think I, I need to, to to meditate on the divine. I actually really do think that that's true. Uh, I think that I I have a, of a deep uh, and abiding need uh, to, um, to connect. And um, you know, one of the the ways that we connect is through our eyes. Um, and so I understand. I have a shaviti, uh, you know, uh, at the place where I, I daven in my in my living room. Uh, I have, I think, sidurim often have the menorah and the shaviti in them for that reason. I think there is a process of of kind of meditation. I think it's a very human thing and a very necessary thing in that way. So, so this is a particularly Jewish way of you of filling in that that human that human need, at least for me. Yes. Yeah, be be beautiful, and and, and uh, so so I, I would both I would both resonate with that uh, <coughs> uh, personally in terms of my personal spirituality, and I also think, um, uh, I, and I also think that this was that this was a um, a very central part of um, of Kabbalistic practice and thought, right? If you we, we look at a lot of, I mean, at least stereotypically, we, if we look at a lot of, of some of the early writing or the, the, the writings of Gershom Sholem, it's not, it's not, it's not a uh, hundred percent the case, but for the most part, um, he, uh, he, he, it was more about the history of ideas and about um, thought than it was about the history of experiences and techniques. Right. And one of the interesting uh, shifts that took place in the last generation, um, particularly with the work of Moshe Idel and others at Hebrew University, and, and it's continued on, is is a movement toward the 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 experiential devotional uh, technique based um, aspects of Jewish mysticism that had been somewhat lost, right, and and or or had or had been de-emphasized anyway, right. So so uh, so Moshe Idel in his book Kabbalah New Perspectives, um, which started out by the way as a series of lectures at the centennial of uh, JTS in the eighties, um, uh, as it happens, um, has all has has multiple chapters on on on, the, on this issue of of, ex, of experience and of. Uh, techniques and and a variety of other scholars, Elliot, Elliot Wolfson and and and, and several and several other several other scholars and and in, in my work on Isaac of Akko, that's at, that's at the center of it as well, right? So the idea that let's say before we say the Amida, before we before we begin this main prayer of um, of Jewish devotion, there is a whole Kabbalistic technique of contemplation. By by this Kabbalist Isaac of Akko of Adonai Svatai Tiftachu Fiagiti Latecha, right? Of course, appended already by by the ancient sages, right? This this line from the Psalms 
to, to as a prayer to pray, but for the Kabbalists, for Isaac of Akko, it was to, to really to enter into God with your mind as a meditative practice, to enter the shores, across the shores of divinity, Adonai Sfatai Tikkah, open those, the, the, the al Sfatayam, the shores nice. of divinity, nice. into... Right, and then my and then my mouth will draw will yagid in the sense of the Aramaic nagad, draw down your praises, your energies, your your chakra, your shefa, um, to draw to draw down all of that that divine energy, that life force of, of of energy through my words. Right, so 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 Morty, you spoke before about the theurgical or about the impact our our words, our actions have upon divinity. So there it's the, by speaking these words, I'm drawing down the energy and bringing divinity into the world. And that's even before I've gotten to the first Baruch of the Amidah, right? Wow. And as you know, this is us just, um, uh, we are we are kind of giving a framework for understanding these two big, big JTS initiatives. We hope that you'll explore more uh, for both. Um, it's great. I just had a uh, uh, a participant say after that answer, Eitan, uh, I get it now. Thanks. Hopefully after <laughs> listening to our podcast, you'll get it even more. It launches tomorrow. Also launching tomorrow is this exhibit. There's still openings for the opening. If you're in the New York area, there will be tours um, and other things. And we'll send out information about those things as they become available. Um, we just want to thank you all for joining us today. Thank you to Maddie and Drora Shalev for sponsoring this session. And we hope you'll come back again next week when um, Rabbi Michal Springer will be exploring a cognitive behavioral therapy and images of divinity. So it'll be a different type of mind game and mental uh, kind of gymnastics in exploring the ideas of God. Um, but thank you all for joining us today. And there'll be a short survey that pops up as you finish. And let me know or feel free to reach out to the Community Engagement Department at JTS if you have additional questions or thoughts or comments. Thank you so much, Dr. Schwartz and Dr. Fishbane, for sharing your insights with us today. It was a great pleasure being with all of you.